There is no period as sophisticated and contradicting itself in history as the Victorian era. They advocated living a proper and prosperous life, but were fascinated with the grim reality of death. The women were supposed to be modest, while men sold their wives in the market to divorce them. They considered makeup tacky, but painted their face with arsenic products to look pasty. Despite being a recent era of history, there are so many layers to this time period, just like crinoline skirts, that every now and then, new shocking information about Victorians unearths itself. Why do women's underwear have no crotch? How were they fine with consuming harmful chemicals knowingly? And what in the name of Her Majesty Queen Victoria was the Great Stink? Welcome to Nutty History, and today, let's visit some disturbing discoveries about the Victorian era. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. Adulteration could blend in and go unnoticeable, but contamination is a whole other story of food and water pollution. Yet somehow, Victorians didn't care much about it despite the fact that they call the cholera outbreak of 1858 the Great Stink. Renowned for the invention of the electric motor, famed scientist Michael Faraday was concerned with the River Thames becoming a cesspool of all kinds of waste, ranging from the industrial, household, untreated sewage, and other waste ending up in the river water. Moreover, the new sensation of flushable toilets only added more pollution to the misery of the river as there was no repository for sewage. Faraday described the River Thames in his observation as the river of an opaque pale brown fluid. That's just nasty in every way you can imagine. Ugh. As the summer of 1858 turned out to be an awfully hot one, the heat wave not only fermented the waste in the river, but also carried the stench to the city. The stench was so bad that the newspapers called it unforgettable, yet people would be lucky to live and remember it. The grim description was a result of the cholera outbreak that soon followed the big stink and claimed almost 15,000 lives, if not more. It was presumed to be a consequence of the stench. Cholera was already widespread in London as the city had seen three outbreaks before 1858 that occurred between 1831 and 1854 and claimed thousands of lives. During the last outbreak, Dr. John Snow, no, no, not that John Snow, this Dr. John Snow had already been working on the suspicion that the disease was spreading due to contaminated water. However, the committee assigned to investigate the disease paid no attention to his findings. But after the big stink happened, the parliament was forced to listen to Dr. John Snow and Robert Koch, and the new sewer was ordered to be constructed away from the River Thames. Do you really know what's in your food? Thanks to the laws of these days, we get to know what our food contains in a list printed on the packaging. Still, there's a degree of trust about it that the food manufacturer isn't hiding anything from us. Victorians, on the other hand, didn't have ingredients listed on packaging, but they were not shy about openly poisoning their food either. Everybody was doing it. As industrialization drew the population towards big cities like London, basic staples like bread began to be produced cheaply to meet the rising demand of the growing number of city dwellers. Victorian manufacturers also saw this as an opportunity to maximize profit by compromising the quality of the bread by using cheaper substitutes that would bulk up the bread without costing much. They adulterated the bread with bean flour, plaster of Paris, chalk, and toxic alum. Three of those four things are not even edible. Alum is an aluminum-based compound that is used in detergent products these days, but back then it made bread heavier and whiter than it was. Thanks to such ill-practice adulteration, malnutrition and stomach problems such as constipation and chronic diarrhea became common in London slums, giving new wings to the mortality rate of the city, causing the deaths of thousands of consumers. Traders were also selling rotten meat dressed with the fat of fresh meat and adding arsenic to pickles and other preserved foods so they may taste tangier. Mmm, rotten meat. Oh. The irony is that manufacturers weren't the only adulterers skimming the consumers. Average British households themselves were adding toxic substances to their diet because of urban myths and misbeliefs. In 1882, in a shocking revelation, it was found that almost one in every five households of England were mixing boracic acid to their food blindly, believing that the mostly harmless substance would purify the milk. Pasteurization wasn't invented and electricity wasn't common yet, so it was common that milk would go sour in households quite quickly. 
According to Mrs. Beaton, a famed journalist, editor, and writer, adding a spoonful or two of boracic acid to milk was the solution to remove the sour taste and smell of bad milk. But she was horrendously wrong. Even taken in small amounts, it can cause nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. But worse, it contains bovine TB that could damage organs and the bones of the spine. Thanks to Mrs. Beaton's advice, around a half million of the English population didn't grow up. We have two wonderful things today that we can thank the Victorian era for, electricity and toilets with modern plumbing. It is rumored that when Queen Victoria used a flushing toilet for the first time, it scared the living daylights out of her. However, the flushing toilets didn't become a victim of her royal authority and spread all across London quite rapidly. However, Queen Victoria's fear of the flush wasn't misplaced, as early flushing toilets often did go out with a boom. The cause of exploding lavatories during the Victorian era was the human waste built up in sewers emanating flammable gases such as methane and hydrogen sulfide that were perhaps leaking back into the homes. As electricity wasn't commonly used to be installed in the privy, people had to take candles in their washroom. Methane seeping from the toilet would make contact with the ignited flame and kaboom! Good heavens, I'm glad they sorted that out and we don't have exploding toilets anymore. Well, except when I eat at Taco Bell. But that's a different story. Electricity itself was not a very safe technology when it arrived in the Victorian era. Electric currents are not a thing to play with and people had very little idea of how it worked, so electric companies had to issue warnings to let people know what not to do with electrical appliances and sockets. So obviously, people obliged and learned to use electricity safely. Not to err is too human, and when it comes to electricity, Victorian people would precisely do what was not asked of them. Consumers would run multiple appliances from the same socket and try to DIY fix the appliances themselves, often without turning them off and tempering with uninsulated wires. The newspapers of the Victorian era always had a lot of reports of people electrocuting themselves. Then there was also the case of generally unsafe electric appliances, such as a bizarre electric tablecloth with a plug for a table lamp that only needed a small spillage of water to go boom and early refrigerator designs were extremely flawed with toxic ammonia leaking from them. Victorians also built electric whips for horses and carried electric rods in their hats and umbrellas. And let's just not talk about how they tried to harness electricity from deceased cats. No era in history is so well defined and renowned for its fashion as the Victorian era. The Victorian era was an elaborate display of class, wealth, beauty, and purpose for women and men. Nearly every layer of their attire was impractical and sometimes uncomfortable, but darn if they weren't always beautifully fashionable. The crinoline period that was popular for two decades between 1850 and 1870 is known today for, as the name suggests, crinoline skirts. These skirts had increasingly ornate layers that were thrown over a large wooden hoop, and when compiled together, they created massive outfits that women would hardly dare to try these days for their daily use. Obviously, crinoline skirts were extremely hazardous. It was like walking in a sumo suit, but only the bottom half of it. Not only did ladies often get themselves stuck in the door, but when you live in an era where electricity was a rare phenomenon, walking in crinoline skirts among candles was just asking to be set on fire. A satirical magazine of the era called Punch advised husbands to register their wives at the fire insurance office. The lack of safety forced crinoline skirts out of fashion eventually. But what women wore underneath them would be considered downright shocking, even today. But somehow, for the prude Victorians, it was completely normal. For underpants, women wore long pairs of bloomers that reached from waist to ankles, but despite being called underpants, they didn't cover their private parts. These bloomers were made to cover only legs, and the rest was in the cold wind. Today, people wear crotchless underwear for, let's just say, surprising their lovers. But back then, there was a reasonable logic behind them. Obviously, it wasn't easy to take off wooden frames of crinolines in the small claustrophobic privy. So the ladies needed the means to use washrooms without taking them off, and that is where crotchless underpants made sense. However, despite easy access to the washroom and airflow, there was one little problem with these bloomers. That time of the month. These ladies were wearing an almost infinite number of layers and a crotchless bloomer but sanitary pads or towels hadn't been invented yet. The result was them getting blood all over their bloomers and inner layers. 
Historians believe that many of them use a baby's nappy held in place by a belt or sticking sheep's wool inside like tampons using lard to avoid a mess. To be fair, before we deep dive too much, this is the perfect place to end this video. Tell us what you think about Victorians in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed the video, do share, like, and subscribe. As always, thanks for watching Nutty History.